got a lot of things on the list for you guys, all of you to do. Hopefully, uh, Father Finelli, when I finish, or when we finish God Bless America, I believe it'll be time to say the grace. Is that okay? Great, great. Okay. Um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Does anyone want to just start the a cappella moment? God bless America. Blessed art thou, and the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, Holy Mother, Holy Mother of God. That we may be worthy of the cross of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth and beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we through the incarnation of Christ thy Son, so we may know by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of the resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let's pray for all the veterans, huh? All those who died in the wars, especially, huh? And all the people who um, uh, gave their gave their lives and their the, 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 their courage to save our country, huh? Mm -hmm. Let's remember them in our prayers today. Now let's now let's the, Let's pray together. Huh? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. May they rest in peace. Amen. 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 In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless us, O Lord. Oh, sorry. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy hands, and to the earth of God, to the sea, and thy God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I apologize for interrupting great conversations. It's kind of the best part of all this lunch, other than the really best part, which is our featured speaker. But the idea of the camaraderie and just, I have a good friend, I have to quote Mary, Mary Esther Hammerfick texted me just before, like about yesterday, she said, oh, Ellen, it will be so good to be with like-minded people. Mary, thank you. And she wasn't kidding. Of course, I, you know, I'm tempted to put a ha-ha after that, but I didn't, because it's the truth. We are so blessed to be in each other's company. 
and this conversation that you know I'm interrupting, I, I feel like I want to apologize, but we know that we're all here for a really important reason, here for Father Lovell. But I'm also honored to be able to say that a really, well, this lady is like one of my, I hate to say it, she's gonna get embarrassed, I think, a little tiny bit. I have always thought when I hear Liz Yor on Bannon being interviewed by him, I think someday I wanna meet that lady. And I've had the pleasure of meeting her more than once, and every time it's still the biggest deal. I am kind of like, she's a celebrity, and I'm very, very honored to be in her company. She's gonna honor us with an introduction of Father to all of you, because she has insights and just a very, very special way of telling this story in preparation for Father's telling it the best of all. Here we go. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. You can have to adjust the microphone, Father, when you yeah, yeah. get up here. Well, Father John Lovell is originally from the south suburbs of Chicago. He was ordained for the Diocese of Rockford in 2007 by Bishop Thomas Doran. Father studied at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, where he obtained a master's in dogmatic theology. I will add, though Father's probably much too humble, I'm sure he was at the top of his class. In 2012, while Father was studying at the Dominican House of Studies, he was removed, or shall we say canceled, by the new Bishop of Rockford, David Malloy. For the last decade, Father Lovell has fought for his good name and has helped many other priests in the same situation, a situation that frankly is growing. In the spring of 2021, he co-founded the Coalition for Canceled Priests. And as I said, it's growing exponentially, and he is their leader. It is my honor to know this good and holy priest. And the Catholic Church is indeed very blessed with this very talented, faithful, dedicated son of the Catholic Church. For those of you who might not know, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano enthusiastically endorsed the Coalition for Cancel Priests in a moving tribute. Vigano said, our Lord calls his sacred ministers blessed when he says, Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Thus have they persecuted the prophets before you. He continued, Persecution is thus a manifestation of the sacrificial nature of the priesthood, following the example of Jesus Christ. He who offers the sacrifice must also be a victim at the same time, an oblation to the divine majesty. Archbishop Vigano ended, I invoke the Lord's greatest blessing upon our beloved priests who have been ostracized, derided, estranged from their communities, struck by illegitimate sanctions, and from whose reputations have been injured. Know that you are all have a very special place in my prayers and in my priestly heart. It is an honor today to introduce you to Father John Lovell, a man with a priestly heart. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. If you would please join me in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided, inspired by this confidence. And I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother, and I come before thee, I stand sorrowful. O Mother of the Lord, my petitions. Amen. Our Lady Queen of the Clergy, St. John the Baptist, St. Martin of Tours, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I have to say it's a great honor now to have been invited twice to speak at the Catholic Citizens of Illinois. My apologies for those of you who are expecting Monsignor Marty Hines, whose picture at first was on the website for the Catholic Citizens of Illinois for this event. It prompted Craig Holly, who is the co-founder of the Coalition for Cancel Priests, to quip, my, have you aged, Father? <laughs> that said, I do pray that I can speak as well as the good Monsignor. When I first went to Rockford, I was stationed at Holy Angels in Aurora as a seminarian under Monsignor Hines. At the time, he was just Father Hines, and he was the one that basically turned around the vocation program in Rockford, where they had in the late 90s and in the 2000s uh, ordination classes every year ranging from 7 to 12. Um, it was a very good program. Bishop Doran had his foibles, but was for the most part a conservative bishop, and he really wanted to have as many priests as possible. Now, sadly, the Diocese of Rockford, I think, is going to ordain one this year, and then they're not going to be ordaining anyone for the next couple of years. That is something that is very troubling for all of us, because every diocese is suffering. And we've been talking about this for decades now, um, less vocations, but the Coalition for Canceled Priests was founded because there are so many priests that are sidelined. And I think many of you were at our inaugural event right here in this room. We were right up there. Liz introduced me as well in, on June 24th, 2021, on the Feast of St. John the Baptist, who, after Our Lady, is our primary patron. And I'm very honored to be here to speak to you today because it's not going to be a talk so much about the coalition, although I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And one question that a lot of people have already asked me, and let me just give you a sneak preview right now. Where are we on buying property? As many of you know, we were hoping to purchase a friary that was abandoned in Cedar Lake, Indiana. We decided to back out of that, not because we had a problem fundraising, not at all. It was simply because after doing our due diligence, doing the inspections, we realized that it was going to cost anywhere from four to five million dollars just to make it habitable, let alone any cosmetic work that needed to be done. And when I say cosmetics, I'm talking about repairing the grottos, putting a chapel back in. The, the, there was just a lot of problems with it that um, we decided to pass on that. But I will have to say that with your prayers, we are hoping by the end of this weekend to have another property in Northwest Indiana under contract. It is not going to be the sprawling 61 acres, uh, but we always thought that that might have been a little too big for us. And we were looking at purchasing the Cedar Lake Friary, not, not only to house priests, but to preserve Catholic heritage. And now that we've passed on that, we are focusing again on just simply finding a house. And so the house that we are looking at that we're hoping we put a bid in on it today is going to have five bedrooms and about three acres of land. And it will be a place that was first what we thought about and what Archbishop Vigano asked us to do, to find a home for priests that do not have a place to go. And so I do ask you to keep that in your prayers and I do have to also make mention of this since today is the Feast of St. Martin of Tours. Um, our CPA for the coalition, he's also my personal CPA, Matthew Pleasy, a very wonderful young man, 
who also runs a website called catechismclass.com. At the age of 33, he very much likes to remind people of the importance of forgotten Catholic customs. And he is also very much in favor, as so am I, of restoring the ancient fasts that Catholics used to do. And he wanted me to remind all of you that today is Martin Mass, as it used to be called, and tomorrow begins what's known as St. Martin's Lent, because tomorrow will mark 40 days until Christmas. And it was when Advent was a little bit longer of a season, and we would prepare not for the first coming of our Lord and remembering that, but for his final coming, which Advent is an awesome season. It still is today. But we started fasting after Martin Mass. And today, in the Middle Evil Ages, was basically Catholic Thanksgiving Day. And other than when it fell on Fridays, you would normally eat goose to celebrate Thanksgiving. And for those of you that are kind of uh, leery about eating goose, I'll just simply say this, we eat turkey. If we can eat turkey, goose is basically a cousin, all right? It's not much different, all right? But he wanted me to remind you of that because we need to get back, and I pretty much mention this in every talk that I do, and when people ask, what can we do for the priests, and it, generosity has just been wonderful to the point where we can purchase a house for priests and to be able to support them, but even above and beyond uh, financial support is just the spiritual support that you give, the sacrifices that you make, the fasting that you do. Uh, St. John Henry Newman said this, there are two wings to get you to heaven, prayer and fasting. It's not one or the other, it's both. You must have both. Jesus makes that quite clear in the Gospels. And while Advent is not as strict of a penitential season as Lent is, I do encourage you, if you could, for the holy souls in purgatory and for the priests starting tomorrow, to do a penance every day, fast, maybe Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and offer that up for the holy souls and for priests that are being persecuted. If you could do that for not just me, but for the coalition, we would appreciate it so much. I would also like to thank all the priests that came, Father Scott Duvall, Father Alex Navarro, Father Michael Majera, who's not canceled, and Father Charles Finelli, who is not canceled either, but he used to be my spiritual director when I was in college seminary over 20 years ago, and uh, I'm one of the reasons he has gray hair. And, um, he was very good to me as a spiritual director, but uh, um, I have to admit that uh, I learned much from him about being a priest, and so I'm very honored that he is here as well. And I would like to start by quoting Newman from his dialogues, uh, Men, Not Angels, the Priests of the Gospel, and just one section of that, St. John Henry Newman says, he came and he went, and seeing that he came to introduce a new and final dispensation into the world, he left behind him preachers, teachers, and missionaries in his stead. Well then, my brethren, you will say, since on his coming, all about him was so glorious, such as he was, such must his servants be, such his representatives, his ministers, in his absence, as he was without sin, they too must be without sin. As he was the Son of God, they must surely be angels. Angels, you will say, must be appointed to the high office. Angels alone are fit to preach the birth, the suffering, and the death of God. They might indeed have to hide their brightness as he before them, their Lord and Master, had put on a disguise. They might come as they came under the old covenant in the garb of men, but still, men they could not be if they were to be preachers of the everlasting gospel and the dispensers of its divine mysteries. 
If they were to sacrifice, as he had sacrificed, to continue, repeat, apply the very sacrifice which he had offered to take into their hands that very victim which he himself to bind and to loose, to bless and to ban, to receive the confessions of his people and to give them absolution for their sins, to teach them the way of truth and to guide them along the way of peace. Who was sufficient for these things but an inhabitant of those blessed realms of which the Lord is never failing light. What excellent logic to do what a priest does. From the human perspective, it would have to be angels. But no, God did not appoint angels. He appointed men. Men from families, no different than your own. Men with the same foibles and the same propensity to sin. The only difference separating priests is that grace that God gave the priest to be ordained. And unlike that wonderful vocation of marriage, which from time beginning was always a natural vocation, raised by Christ to the supernatural level, the priesthood always was supernatural. And the priest never chooses it for himself. The priest is chosen. And for any of you that have been to an ordination, you see that wonderful ceremony where the bishop asks the people of God if this man should be ordained and the consent is given by the church. My vocation to the priesthood was not a choice I made. I made the choice to accept it. But at baptism, I was given this vocation. Woe to me, woe to all priests that take it up. It is not an easy vocation. And many times when we hear about canceled priests, again, priests that have not done something wrong, priests who've been canceled by the cancel culture in the church for standing up for the truth, for standing up for the traditional mass, for standing up for a wide variety of things, sometimes you would never think even 10 years ago would be a problem, but they're canceled for it, is we have to realize that all of us are being denied a confessor, a preacher. We're being denied the opportunity to participate in mass. And while canceled priests always have the privilege to celebrate what we call a private mass, with the church triumphant in attendance, with all the angels and the saints, when we hide priests and tell them that they cannot minister, what we are doing is denying the people of God what God wants them to have. It is as simple as that. It is as simple as that. And I want to read to you from a good friend of mine who just got his doctorate in canon law, the introduction to his thesis. Now I'm going to tell you, even the best of doctoral theses are pretty hard to read, especially when it comes to the law. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I do encourage you to get the book. You can get it on Amazon. It is called The Right of a Cleric to Bona Fama. By, Joe, by Michael Joseph Mazza. Again, he is one of our canon lawyers that helps us and is a very good consultant. And he writes this. On Friday morning, September 13th, 2013, in his homily during Mass in the chapel of the Domus Santa Marte, Pope Francis used the occasion of the day's Gospels reading, Luke 6, 39-42, to warn in no uncertain terms of the danger of slander. Quote, every time we judge our brother in our hearts or worse, when we speak badly of them with others, we are murdering Christians, end quote. He added that because, quote, slander always moves in the direction of crime. There is no such thing as innocent slander, end quote. Finally, he urged his audience to say no to the weapon of slander because it is deadly. This study aims to demonstrate how true these words are. The right to a good name is fundamental 
natural human right, and one that is specifically mentioned in Canon 220 of the Code of Canon Law as bona fama. It is both entitled to protection and subject to the good of the ecclesial community. Such a right cannot be seen in isolation. There is no slander if what is revealed about a convicted criminal, for example, is both true and important for the community to know. The need for accurate information has become increasingly consequential in the wake of the clerical sexual abuse scandals that have rocked the Catholic Church for the better part of the last three decades, especially in the English-speaking world. While the common good demands that the vulnerable will be protected from harm, it also demands that the good name of those who might be accused is protected. Thus, all those in the cause of justice, and particularly those within the Catholic Church, ought to be especially concerned about defining, valuing, protecting, vindicating the right of clerics to their good name in the wake of such scandals. This task assumes particular significance in these days of instant, lasting, and worldwide means of communication via the internet. Balancing the desire for transparency and the respect for the fundamental human rights, such as due process, has never been more important nor challenging. The right to bona fama extends to everyone, just as it appears manifestly unjust to blacken the good name of a hardworking priest who has devoted his life to the spread of the gospel on the flimsiest piece of evidence and without due process. So it is also wrong to defame an individual bishop who may be imposing some kind of process or discipline on a priest without an adequate understanding of the full picture. Likewise, the reputation of an accuser needs to be safeguarded, at least until the veracity of, and perhaps the motivation behind, an accusation is ascertained. In other words, a rush to judgment in a given dispute poses a grave risk for the ecclesial community, for the ability of the church to witness to the world, and for the souls of those involved. Finally, he says, at least from what I'm quoting, that church, instituted by the incarnate Son of God and guided by the Holy Spirit, has seated share of members who have been falsely accused throughout the years. The list, of course, starts with our Lord himself, who was falsely accused, subject to dubious legal proceedings, and ultimately crucified. But the list also includes ordinary men and women from all times and places, falsely accused of all manner of malfeasance. Christians are well aware that following the Lord might involve giving up one's reputation or even one's life, yet this does not mean that such goods should not be defended. On the contrary, as explored in greater detail throughout the study, the effectiveness of the church's salvific mission in the world depends to a great degree on the integrity of its members, especially its ordained ministers. In an age such as the present one, when many priests have seen their rights to bona fama violated, a study of this nature is especially relevant. Again, I highly recommend The Right of a Cleric to Bona Fama. It is an excellent book. Yes, it can be dry in places, as all good doctoral theses are, but he lays out the importance of when a priest is canceled, he has to move immediately to start correcting the injustice. I've said this in talks before, and I will say it again. Bishops act like bullies. They rarely admit to mistakes unless they're about to lose a huge sum of money. Sad to say. And they will double down and keep priests out of ministry because they do not want to be seen as weak. This happens all over the country. And for those that say, well, we have some good bishops, and we do, compared to others, I must remind everyone that even the good bishops shut down all their churches during COVID, and none has of yet apologized and promised that that would not happen again. Now, I'm just making a point of fact. I'm not attacking any specific bishop. But I will tell you this. Canon 974 of the Code of Canon Law says, the local ordinary, 
and the competent superior are not to revoke the faculty to hear confession habitually except for a great cause. Let me read that to you again. The local ordinary, meaning the bishop, and the competent superior are not to revoke the faculty to hear confessions habitually except for great cause. Elsewhere in the code, that great cause is determined to be what we say in Latin, a delict, which means a crime. If there's no crime, there can't be punishment. But what's been happening now, especially since the Dallas Charter, is that bishops are sidestepping canon law and are removing priests in a non-penal, non-judicial way. If you look at the decree against me and the decree against Father Duval, and I believe also Father Navarro, we are not suspended because that would instantly invoke a canonical trial. We are restricted in ministry in an administrative way in a non-penal, non-judicial way. And you might be saying, but Father, how do they get around Canon 974? And I'm not a Canon lawyer. I want to make that quite clear. I am not a Canon lawyer. But to tell you right now how they get around this, here it is. Let me read it to you a third time. The local ordinary and the competent superior are not to revoke the faculty to hear confession habitually except for a great cause. Ah, there's the word habitually. Let's define habitually. Because I've been out of ministry for 10 years and Rome has said that Bishop Malloy can remove my faculties temporarily, but they could only be temporarily. That he has to give me my faculties back. But it's been 10 years. Not back yet. And so they're hiding behind the word habitually. Well, we're, we're eventually going to give it back to him, maybe when he's drawing his last breath. And some have argued, many a good canonists, that it is invalid and that we've never lost our faculties. I must also remind everyone that we have to stop using non-canonical terms, meaning language that is not found in the code, to describe priests out of ministry. Nowhere in the code does it say a priest in good standing or he's not in good standing. I think we've all heard that before. Well, you need a letter of good standing if you want to come to my parish. In the last 10 years, I've had several students get married and I had no intention of celebrating at the wedding. I was just going to simply go there in cassock and surplus and sit what we call in choir, in coro, up in the sanctuary with the other priests. And if I go to a diocese outside of Rockford, they will still require me to show what they call a letter of good standing. Why? I'm not doing anything. I'm simply attending. Yes, I'm sitting in the sanctuary, but I'm not performing any function as a minister. I am simply sitting where the clergy should sit. There could be a whole nother talk given about the importance of hierarchy and realizing that hierarchy is not as bad as we're made to believe. There is a hierarchy in the church. There is a reason why there is a sanctuary. There is a reason why priests sit in one area and the laity sit in others. It's not to show that the priests are better than the laity. Trust me, we're not. It is simply to show the difference of office and what priests have been set aside to do. But so often, I've heard it say, well, you could still attend the wedding. I had one vicar general up in Minnesota. I can't remember the name of the diocese. It's one of the small ones. They're all small in Minnesota. And he says, well, we're, we're still going to let you wear clerics. And I said, Father, you don't have the right to tell me what I can wear. Sorry. I'm going to wear clerics. If I want to wear my cassock, I'm going to wear my cassock. You can't tell me that because you know why? I haven't committed a crime. 
I haven't committed a delict. Let's talk about somebody who did commit a crime, who committed a delict, Theodore McCarrick. And he committed many over many decades. And until very recently, many of the bishops were very cozy with him. He no longer can wear clerics. He has been laicized. However, you are a priest forever. He is morally obligated, if he sees someone dying, to anoint him to hear his confession. Because no matter how bad Theodore McCarrick is as a person, he still has the power of the priesthood to forgive and to heal. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be thinking about a priest's sins when I'm dying on the road. What I'm going to be thinking about is, thank God that there's a priest there to absolve me from my sins. Something that many of us do not have because of this cancellation. In the Rockford Diocese alone, over 12 priests have been canceled. How many confessions were lost? How many anointings were lost? And what spurred us to start forming a coalition was one, McCarrick being removed and finally uncovered. By the way, I heard the McCarrick story in 20, 2002. I just graduated from college seminary. I was about to enter major seminary. I was in Kalamazoo visiting a friend at a rectory. The pastor was telling us all the things that McCarrick did. Right down to the smallest detail, I remember it was so horrid. It, you, you ever hear those things that you can never forget? It was one of those things. And so 16 years later, I've now been canceled for six years. It's finally breaking of what McCarrick is doing. And it was exactly how I heard it in 2002. And so when you hear these bishops, especially those that lived and worked with McCarrick, said, oh, I, I had no idea. They knew it in Kalamazoo. And you didn't know it in D.C.? Or Bishop Malloy, who when the Dallas Charter came out was the Associate General Secretary for the USCCB. Guess in 2002, guess the USCCB. Guess which bishop they put in charge to writing the Dallas Charter, protecting God's children. Guess, McCarrick, whose name is on everything. You know whose name's also on everything? Beloys, because he was the assistant general secretary. It just makes sense. That's bureaucracy. And so when this all started to break in 2018, Bishop Beloy was tripping over himself, basically saying, well, I, I lived in DC, but I, I never really interacted with, with McCarrick. I, I barely knew the guy. Well, yeah, he was in charge of this, and I was his assistant, but we never talked. Uh-huh. And he got criticized for that one time. And he challenged the priest. He regretted challenging that priest. It wasn't me. I wish it was me. <laughs> it wasn't me. But as I mentioned, it's not only Canon 974, but also Canon 212, which allows for the laity and for the clergy when necessary, and I'm paraphrasing now, to stand up to the sacred pastors, the bishops, and tell them when they're doing something wrong. That is Canon 212. Canon 220, which this whole dissertation is based on, is about bona fama, the right to a good reputation for everyone in the church. You do not sacrifice that just simply because you got ordained. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we going to stand up and start fighting for what canon law clearly gives us to right to stand up for? Or are we going to simply say, well, he's the bishop and we've got to be obedient. It's true. <laughs> I agree with you. And I had the great fortune of studying at two schools, at least in the systematic 
Catholics department were very Thomistic, Mount St. Mary's and the Dominican House of Studies, probably the greatest theologate in the Western Hemisphere. You have to go to Europe to find better, and even there you're not really going to find better, the Dominican House of Studies. I always like to say, okay, you, you want to be obedient? Okay. Define obedience for me. I'm like, can't. Because we've all thought of obedience, and again, this is because of social media, television, movies, we all see it as, well, you just shut up and do what you're told by your superior. I like to say it's very Jesuitical. And most bishops think that they're the Jesuit superior general and their priests are a Jesuit novice. You just do what you're told and be a yes man. And there are many priests that are like that. You want to know why it took almost 20 years after I first heard about it of McCarrick being exposed? Because a lot of people knew about it and I said, eh, not my pig, not my farm. Well, I'm not going to expose it. It's on him, not me. I, I hear that a lot about so many things. Well, it's on the bishop. It's on the bishop. If the bishop is doing something wrong just, and the bishop wants you to do something wrong, just do it anyway. It's on his head. It's not on yours. Uh-uh. bishop asks you to go out and kill somebody and you go out and kill somebody, it's still on your head. And so I often encourage people, and I had the great fortune to give a copy to Father Finelli today, but a wonderful little book called True Obedience by Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. It's about 100 pages. It's not very long. If you have a long afternoon, you could read it in one sitting. And he lays out specifically what obedience is. And he distinguishes obedience that a man and wife owe each other in marriage, what a religious owes to their superior, and what a diocesan priest owes to his bishop. When all the priests of this room were ordained priests, we promised, we did not vow, religious take vows, we promised obedience to be co-workers with the bishop. To work with him in the presbyterate. The bishop is the head of the presbyterate. Yes, he is our spiritual father. In fact, if anyone, biological or not, deserves the title of father in a diocese, it is the office of bishop. Every single bishop should be worthy of that title. I said should be. But that doesn't mean that the bishop gets to treat his spiritual sons, the priests, as if they're three or four year olds, that we don't know what we're doing. We are adult sons, and we work with our father, or at least we are supposed to. We are not to simply say, well, Bishop, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. We'll just we'll figure out a way to make it happen. No. A presbyteral council meeting should be charitable, but at times should be raucous. And any good leader is going to want to hear from those that work with him dissent. I read somewhere sometime that Lyndon Baines Johnson had someone specifically on his staff to sit in on meetings and then when the meeting was over to basically tell him what he said or did wrong. Now, many of us might not think that Johnson was a great president, but oh, if more leaders did that. Oh, if more leaders started to follow the example of we're working together, I'm not the general, you're not the private. And now some might say, well, Father, that's all well and good, but you know, there's the great stories of saints. It's always Padre Pio that comes up. <laughs> Padre Pio was silenced for years. Maybe you should be more like Padre Pio. You want to know the difference between Padre Pio and me? He was a Franciscan and a religious. I am not a Franciscan. I hope to be religious, but I am not part of a religious order. I did not take a vow of obedience. 
I took a promise of celibacy, a promise to celebrate the divine office, and a promise to be co-workers with the bishop and to be obedient to the bishop as far as canon law says. And so when they start acting outside of canon law, I have the right to defend my good name. I did not pick the title for this talk. I don't know who did. Broken Cups, how our best priests have been sidelined. There's not a priest in this room, and I know them all very well, that would say, I'm one of the best priests you'll ever meet. You're not going to hear that from my lips. All right. I might think some of the, pri the priests in here are some of the best priests I know, and that's true. But we're all sinners, even the priests. But even great sinners deserve the right of bona fama the right to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. And by the way, the right to a speedy trial, as McCarrick got, some would say maybe a little too speedy, Vatican wanted to sweep that under the rug very quickly. It took years in Rome for my case to go through three different dicasteries. It kept getting clogged up because Bishop Alloy would go over there and just transfer it to another dicastery. Finally, I had to send one of my canon lawyers into the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. It's about four or five years ago. To basically say, will you take a look at Father's case? It's been sitting here for three or four years. And he said to me afterwards, he says, Father, if we didn't keep going and I didn't keep going into the office pretty much every week pestering them, it would probably still be sitting on a desk. That needs to stop. And you know how that stops? Through you of saying, when is enough enough to stand up as the laity and to preach Jesus Christ and, if at times, to the bishops themselves? All of us have probably heard what Fulton Sheen said. Don't expect reform in the church to come from the bishops or the priests or the religious. It's going to come from you, dear laity. And oftentimes, the coalition finds itself, not on purpose, but in activist situations. We will defend the traditional Latin mask as an attack on the mass, as an attack on the priesthood. We will take a leaf out of the books of others, whether they're conservative or liberal, for example, and you could read this in an article I wrote for LifeSite News called Feeding Crocodiles. Our good friend, Father Altman, who has spoken as well at CCI luncheons, and Father Flager, both of whom are on different ends of the spectrum ecclesial, you know, in the ecclesial world. I mean, I think everyone would agree with that, okay? There's not much Father Altman or Father Flager have in common. But, what do they do? They stay ahead of the story. They don't accept the premise of the bully, in the case of the bishop, and they keep, keep it up front and center. This is why Father Flager is always put back into ministry. His parishioners throw the archdiocese up against the wall, forces them to do a speedy investigation, and he's put back into ministry. I will be shocked if he's not put back in ministry again. I don't know if he's done something wrong. That's above my pay grade. But what I do know is that they sometimes do have a good sense of how to fight the diocese time and time again. That doesn't mean I endorse Father Flager. That doesn't mean I agree with everything that Father Altman says or how he says it. I wish, though, especially conservative Catholics and conservatives in general in this country, stop worrying about people's tone and start worrying about the substance of what is being said. Because otherwise we're going to have bloodbaths like we did Tuesday. I was not surprised that it was a red puddle. It wasn't a red wave. 
You think the people that orchestrated 2020 was going to let, let it flip in 2022? Especially after Dobbs? No. That's not going to happen. And sadly, it's very similar in the church. I wish, I wish that wasn't the case. And on the so-called Catholic right in the church, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it, there's really basically three main groups. Neocons, Charismatics, and Trads. Everybody likes dumping on the Trads. Okay. And don't get me wrong, Dr. Scott Hahn said this best. There are rad trads, there are mad trads, and there are glad trads. And he says, I hope I am a glad trad. And I hope I'm a glad trad as well. But how he just divided up that group, you could say the same thing for the neocons and the charismatics. Do you know how many times growing up I was told that I would never fully understand being Catholic unless I was slain in the spirit? <laughs> that I had to pray a certain way that I had to be, yes, conservative, but not too conservative. It happens all the time. The Diocese of Arlington, which suffered the most, before Traditionalis Custodis, probably had the most traditional Latin masses per capita, got annihilated by Bishop Burbage, who many people would consider a good bishop. It's a good diocese. The presbyterate there is excellent for the most part. What happens? Archbishop Chapu just recently goes out there to give a talk. And I think most people would say Archbishop Chapu is one of the better bishops. And what does he say? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of good that Pope Francis did this because, you know, there were some people that uh, in, the, in the traditional movement that just weren't following Vatican II. I read all 16 documents of Vatican II. There's really only four that are important, the main ones. Dei Verbum, Sacrosanctum Concilium, Gaudium et Spes, and then really the most important document of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium. Okay. I read those a couple of times. I still haven't found in any of those documents what new dogma, what new anathema, what clarification was given that we all of a sudden have to follow. I don't see in any oath of fidelity that's been changed since Vatican II. It was a pastoral council. They made that quite clear. It was not de fide. Pope Paul VI made that quite clear. Yet you hear this line constantly. Well, they're not following the council. What exactly are we supposed to follow out of those documents? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you're following Sanctum Sanctum Concilium, the 1962 missile is in more in line with it than the 1969 missile. And I'm sorry, but for those of you that think, well, you know what, I don't really go to the traditional Latin mass, so it doesn't affect me. Of course it does. They're coming after you next. Anything that reeks of orthodoxy in the church, they're coming after. Don't believe me? Look at St. Stanislaus Koska. Never had the traditional mass, only had ad orientum. Nope, 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 can't do that. You have to face the people. Tell me where it says that in the council. You're not going to find it. I had a priest say to me one time, well, do you celebrate mass privately? I said, every day. Every day I try to celebrate mass, the traditional Latin mass. Well, did you get the bishop's permission to do that since Traditionis Custodis? And I said, Father, if you read Traditionis Custodis, and you actually think after reading it that Pope Francis has the right and the authority to simply take away the Mass when Pope Benedict, only 11 years before, said it was never abrogated and it can't be abrogated. That all of a sudden in that he does have the right to do this. I say, sorry, we do not live by positive law where one Pope says one thing and the next Pope says something totally different and to say to follow it. I have the greatest respect and love for the office of Peter. I'm hoping no more and no less than everyone else in this room. However, having great love for our spiritual fathers and for the offices they hold, 
requires us as good children, according to Canon 2.12, to at times remind them when they're doing something wrong. Canceled priests are being abused by their bishops. You don't say to abuse children, suck it up. It didn't hit you that hard. No, you stop the abuse. You try to correct it in the most charitable way possible. And we don't sit there and say things like, well, you know, I don't know if we can have Father come and speak. You know, he's not a priest in good standing. Or I've had um, publications say, well, Father, we love your article, but you know, you're not a priest in good standing, so we can't publish it. What does me have to be in good standing have to do with what I just wrote? Either you like it or you don't like it. Father, we want you to come and speak on the Sacred Heart. Oh, you're not in good standing. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, when they attack canceled priests, they're not attacking the person. They're attacking the priesthood. Just like when they attack the Mass, they're attacking the priesthood. I'm going to stand up and defend the priesthood even against those that should be safeguarding it. I encourage Catholic citizens of Illinois to realize, and I had a very good conversation with Kevin White when we talked about me doing this talk, that at times we have to, in charity, offend the bishops. They don't like being told that they're wrong. Sometimes they need to hear it. I want bishops that have our best interests at heart, that best interest at heart is the deposit of faith. Not the latest going or coming of what some internet idol says. Did you see that Father James Martin had another audience with Pope Francis today? Cardinal Burke and Cardinal uh, Walter Bueller is still waiting for a response from the dubia from years ago. We're being told that we should allow for LGBTQ XYZ, that we should allow divorce and remarriage, that we should allow them to receive communion, that it is all right for Catholics not in good standing, again, here's that word, in good standing, but Catholics who are not practicing the faith such as our politicians, to continue receiving the sacraments, even when maybe their own bishop has said that they can't. doesn't matter. As long as you believe the liberal line, it is all right. Jason Jones, who is a great friend of the coalition, said this best. Before Traditionis Custodis, he never went to the traditional Latin Mass after he saw the carnage and the unpastoral nature of the document said, well, we're all trads now. Just like in politics, conservatives have to put aside their little differences and unite or die. So in the church, those Catholics of goodwill and good heart, whether they fall into the camps of the neocon, the charismatic, or the traditionalists, are going to have to put aside their little differences to unite. We have to defend each other. We have to foster vocations to traditional orders, such as the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King. And yes, I dare say maybe even the Society of Pius X. That might be hard for some people in this room to hear. And let me say this. Me saying that does not mean that I condone the Society. In fact, I only met my first Society priest in 2021, so I am no expert. But we have to start asking ourselves, are we going to unite or are we going to allow ourselves to be picked off one by one? Or are we going to defend our priests that have been canceled? Or are we going to hold to account priests that have done something wrong? I'm sorry. How many people went up to La Crosse when Monsignor Burrell, also known as Monsignor Grinder, was put back into ministry to protest? They knew they were going to get away, from that, get away with that. 
Same summer, remove Altman, same summer, Burrell, who was General Secretary of the USCCB, gets caught on Grinder. He's back in ministry. You know what Bishop Callahan said in the letter reinstating him? Well, he committed no crime. Okay. Show me what crime Father Altman has committed. Show me what crime I've committed that after 10 years of not being able to witness my students' marriages, to not to be able to baptize my niece in public, to not be able to celebrate my father's funeral, to not to be able to give the sacraments to the people of God, while we see other priests cower, and bishops cower, for not going into the hospitals at the, at the so-called height of COVID. We started fighting back because of McCarrick. We started fighting back because of the COVID lockdown and shutdowns. The Catholic Church and her priests must lead the way. I encourage everyone in this room to start standing up to the bishops. Don't worry about whether or not you can get them to come to the luncheon or get them to talk at a banquet, all right? In charity, you have the duty and the obligation according to Canon 212 to speak what is right even to the bishops. If I may finish with a quote from La Cordaire, which I heard when I was very young, and at times when I am uh, feeling down, I like to read it about the priest. And he entitled it, Father La Cordaire entitled it, The Priest. To live in the midst of the world without wishing its pleasures, to be a member of each family, yet belonging to none, to share all suffering, to penetrate all secrets, to heal all wounds, to go from men to God and offer him their prayers, to return from God to men, to bring pardon and hope, to have a heart of fire for charity and a heart of brown bronze for chastity, to teach and to pardon, console and bless always. My God, what a life, and it is yours, O priest of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, they are trying to pick us off by isolating good priests, not letting them live out their vocation. The fathers in this room are called, as I said at the beginning, from that quote from St. John Henry Newman, to preach, to forgive sins, to offer the sacrifice for the people of God, to anoint the sick when they're dying, to bring viaticum to the people that when they are dying. You take that away, problems are going to develop. And this is why we are seeking property for priests to live in community so that those priests can have a prayer life together. Those priests know that someone has their back. And we hope, with your help, to stop the abuse from people that should be protecting us, should be guiding us, and who deserve, or at least should deserve, the title of father above anyone else, that is the bishops. If anyone has a problem with what I said today, I will be more than happy to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. What I am tired of is getting the trolls on the internet who hide behind names and attack us for doing one simple thing, making sure priests have the right to their good name, the right to good process, the right to a decent meal on the table, and a roof over their head. We do not want the pleasures of this world. We simply want to minister to you. Know that for all the priests in this room, we will be praying for you. Please pray for us, and know that we love you very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. If there are any questions right now, I really feel it would be possibly a good time. I know there are one-on-one -on -one that Father offered, but as well, there are things maybe you... Go ahead, Marianne. Yes, another diocese could take us, another bishop could. Uh, the priests that are not suspended. Now, a priest that is suspended, uh, another bishop could not take him. All right. 
but Bishop Strickland, Archbishop Cordelione, Bishop Fraki could take all of us right now and give us faculties. Right now. They're not simply because they don't want to upset their brother bishop. It's a boys club. They go to the USCCB twice a year at over a million dollars a meeting. They, they don't want to get the wrath from their, from their fellow bishops. I hate to say it, but it's true. Father Parker and I were at an event in October of 2021. He went up to Bishop Strickland and said, may I come to your diocese? He said, only if Bishop Malloy says it's okay. Now, a priest could join a religious order, but that's a different vocation. Now I'm going to get a little technical, and again, this goes into canon law. A priest could join what's called the Society of Apostolic Life, like the Fraternity of St. Peter, where priests live, uh, secular priests live in community, or at least they should. We don't need the bishop's permission to do that. They could take us immediately. Well, here's the problem. If I wanted to join, for example, the Institute of Christ the King, they will never take me. You know why? They have an apostolate in Rockford. Why are they going to upset the Bishop of Rockford? They might lose their apostolate. Over one priest, they're not going to do it. And some people say, when they say, well, why don't you just become a religious then? That's kind of like saying, well, why did you become married? It's, it's a different vocation. It's a wonderful vocation, both marriage and religious life. But there are three vocations in the church, permanent vocations, priesthood, marriage, and the consecrated life. And yes, some in the consecrated life do get ordained priests, but they are first religious. Does that make sense, I hope? Yeah, I mean, to get that canonical trial so that the other can you know, can get that due process that seems to be the core issue. The, the problem is, excellent question. So, should the lady help to try to initiate a canonical trial? Well, there can't be a canonical trial if a delict hasn't been committed. It's like, you, you know, we go to court, we take the, you know, everybody's like, we're going to sue. You've got to have certain parameters in order to sue, okay? Otherwise, it's going to be tossed out immediately. Just the same in canonical court, okay? I've done nothing wrong. They technically haven't actively besmirched my good name. They've done it passively. Well, that's hard to prove in canonical court or in civil court. I encourage the laity, again, I said this at the beginning, yes, fast and pray, the most important things you can do, right there, boom. St. Martin's Lent begins tomorrow, just a reminder. But what you can do is you can approach the bishops and say in charity. Can I give you an example? I mean, most of us are probably going to be at the WSFI event. All right. Archbishop Cordelione, thank you so much for finally prohibiting Nancy Pelosi from receiving communion. Can you please tell me why it took 10 years? How, how is that uncharitable? It's not, you know. I think the bishops need to be confronted more. In charity, yes, but they need to be confronted more. They, most of them act like princes. Oh, don't bother me. Don't, don't, don't bother me. Last two years, the, the coalition has gone to the Napa Institute in Napa, California. This is where all the rich people go to support the bishops. And the bishops like going there, one, because it's free for them. And two, 
they, they think for the most part they are surrounded by allies and they can relax a little bit. All right? I am not in favor of confrontations that are uncharitable. In your face, screaming, yelling, leave that for the south side, okay? <laughs> but I am for simply the lady approaching the bishop in person. You could write all the letters you want. You could write all the petitions that you want. And just go, boom, right into the garbage, all right? But when you see them at confirmations, when you see them at events like next week, Paprocki is going to be there as well. What are you doing? Mean, Paprocki and Coeur d'Alene are canon lawyers. How can you allow this sidestepping of canon law, this nonsensical language of non penal, non judicial way? You're a canon lawyer. Aren't you offended that they're sidestepping canon law? You spent all those years becoming a canon lawyer. And now both Rome and your fellow bishops are just simply sidestepping it. I think that could be said charitably. Father? One other thing you have to, uh, this is not really a question, but uh, to, to all of you, the ladies, you also have to understand that unlike what would have happened to Father and myself, Father here, Father, is they can't do anything to you. You know, so you confronting them, it's, you know, it could be unpleasant, but they can't suspend you. So that, that's, that's what we're fighting. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's been no investigation of me. I mean, he hears a rumor and he thinks it's true. And he runs to Rome before he'll even run to me. In fact, one time Rome had to tell him. He basically, this is in 2016. He basically went to Rome and said, well, we got a report that Father Lovell was sexting with somebody. Obviously, that wasn't true. But apparently, that happened in 2014. Well, Rome said, well, we can't do anything until you ask Father Lovell about it. All of a sudden, the diocese was tripping over itself to have me come in for, for a meeting. And so I go in there with my canon lawyer, who I flew in from Rome at my own expense. This is one of the reasons why we have the coalition. We didn't have it then. And we went in there, and you know, they give us this affidavit. And this young man was basically accusing me of this. And my canon lawyer read through it and goes, uh, uh, Bishop Malloy, it's January 2016. This happened, this person apparently came to you in 2014. Why are we only hearing about it now? And it was, it was hilarious because the person that was writing up the affidavit was Monsignor Eric Barr, who shortly after that was removed. Okay. And it even said in the affidavit, oh, there's no evidence to back this up. There, there, the texts don't exist. They even admitted that. But he sent it to Rome anyway as, well, he must be guilty because somebody said it. I don't even know if this young man, I don't even know that I don't, the young man, according to them, was a parishioner of mine at my first assignment. I hadn't talked to him since I left. I don't even know if this young man actually said anything. They just got a name of a parishioner, a former parishioner of mine, to give it at least some credibility. And then, but they even put in the affidavit, but there's no evidence, there's, there's no text. The texts don't exist. They, they actually said that. You know, but they have this whole thing of me coming up there, and you know, from the south suburbs to Rockford is two hours away. So. So he's acting on slander, he's acting on, on a, mm -hmm. a false accusation. Yeah, I mean, bear in mind, most of you have heard this because most of you have heard me talk before. I was basically removed because I was a whistleblower. Right. I actually reported a lay teacher fondling a lay student at Marion Central Catholic High School in Woodstock. And that's when the trouble began. Under Doran, but Doran wouldn't let his underlings 
really do anything with it. Within six weeks of being made a bishop, Malloy removed me. I wasn't even in the diocese at the time. I was studying it in Washington, D.C. for my license and for my doctorate in sacred theology. So, so I think you have to fight the arbitrary removal. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes, but I agree. But that's kind of similar to writing petitions. I think it is very important, though, in charity to confront the bishops. Okay, And a lot of bishops hide, even the good ones. You know, they, I mean, I can almost guarantee you there will be handlers surrounding them next Friday. You know, they don't just simply walk open, and they have to. They, Pope Francis said this, and he's actually right on this. The shepherds have to smell like the sheep, plain and simple. We had a question over here. Yes? So you said there are 12 canceled priests in the Rockford Diocese. That we know of, yes. The Chicago, we know some. We don't know the full extent. Father Finelli might have better numbers for that. Um, Joliet, I know of a few. But outside of your own diocese, you don't really, thank God, actually hear the going-ons of other dioceses. So, like, we have an organization that's helping 40 to 50 priests around the country and around the world. It's because they came to us or somebody informed them of us, and we went to them. Okay, and what happens? That this prob I probably would have been in the same situation in 2012 when I was removed. You know, come up and like, hey, we got this organization. We're going to help you. I probably would have said, you know what? I'm going to let the process work itself out. The process does not work itself out because Rome is going to give the benefit of the doubt to bishops every single time. Sorry, I'm getting away from the microphone, which is recording. Like, obviously, I don't need the microphone. Um, but this is basically what happens. Rome will take up the case, whether it's canonical or administrative, mine was administrative, it's what's called a hierarchical recourse. And they will let the bishop submit things without telling me. And you know how I know this? Because when we get the final report from Rome, basically the sentence, and it goes, whereas, whereas, whereas. When you start reading through it, you're like, uh-oh, Rome made a mistake. I was not aware of this. And you go, oh, Rome didn't make a mistake. Malloy shared something with Rome and didn't share it with me. Now, either Rome thinks he shared it with me or they're complicit in just covering things up. Rome, Malloy tried to slip this whole sexting thing in and Rome caught it and said, no, 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 you have to ask Father Lovell about this. That was 2016. It's now 2022. Uh, 2022. So, you know, question over here? Uh, well, like you just answered it for me, really. I was wondering how many canceled priests there were. And, uh, There's hundreds, if not thousands. And, and thank you for mentioning this because I, I, I forgot to finish this. I know of a priest in the Diocese of Lafayette in Indiana. The Bishop of Lafayette, Indiana, is Timothy Doherty. He's a priest of Rockford. He is going after a young priest who was only ordained four or five years ago. And I talked to this priest, and he, just, he simply said to me, he said, Father, I trust that Bishop Doherty has my best interest at heart. <laughs> he honestly believed that. You could hear it in his voice. And so it's going to be about two or three years before he starts to realize, oh, wait, that's not true. Even with Father Parker. Father Parker went silent. Because he was told, especially by his supporters in Batavia, well, maybe being vocal is not the way to do it, so let's just be quiet, and maybe the bishop will let you go quietly. That hasn't happened yet. So do we know, or do we all know, or is this a pattern of, did it particularly this type of stuff? Did it just a last mass, or a sex person, or whatever? It's usually some form of unadulterated Catholicism. It doesn't have to be the traditional Latin Mass. I mean, look at the Irish priest, Father Xi, that we're uh, uh, sending best wishes to. I mean, he basically stood up and simply taught the perennial teachings of the church that, you know, homosexuality is wrong. By the way, it's one of the few sins that cries to heaven for vengeance. All right. And, uh, you know, I mean, the bishop came out and apologized for him teaching the Catholic faith. That was a Novus Ordo Mass. 
So when you know when I I love telling people I go to the Novus Ordo and my priest is pretty good, so you know I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm, they're coming after you too. Oh yeah. 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 And and yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And and I'll say this is and I, I wrapped up my talk with this, is you 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 can't have an either or position when it comes to Catholic tradition. Okay. Your priests that have never never celebrated the traditional Latin Mass and don't care for it. They're doing themselves and you a disservice because it's part of our history. You become a better priest by studying what was the ancient rite of the church. You know, but what are we told? Oh, it, you know, it was a reform in the 60s. Yes, because all good reforms come out of the 1960s. All right, you know, and this was the mass before the French or the Gauls or those evil medieval popes started changing anything. No. <laughs> You, you know, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, whose book I recommend, and he makes several books, he makes it quite clear that probably one of the oldest prayers in the Roman Rite is the Roman canon, more than likely written by Peter himself. And they tried to get rid of that, by the way. Paul VI had to intervene and say no. But I can guarantee you, most of you never hear the Roman canon at Mass because you have about 50 other versions of uh, Eucharistic prayers that you're able to say. When I celebrated the Novus Ordo, I only used the Roman canon. Because I knew even then how important it was. And everybody loved it because I was mentioning all the saints. Yeah. So, yes? I'm not the brightest light bulb in the package, but my husband and I were Jesus Christ when I met. We were in the void. And I don't know, maybe there's something here, but I, we appreciated it so much. We became like, yeah, like on Saturday afternoon. Well, let me tell you how we accept people into the coalition. And it was like, because of like, well, I heard people say, oh, you're going to that. You know, you don't know what the bishop. Yeah, I know. I've heard that before, too. You don't know what the bishop knows. Yeah. You mean like how he knew about Theodore McCarrick and covered it up? You mean like that? Yeah. It's true. Oh, it's... It, we, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And we, anyone can go on our website and see the form that the priests have to fill out. Uh, the due diligence team, Father Duvall is here right now. They, they do a strenuous background check. Now, the internet, for the most part, is a sewer. However, it does allow for many people to do uh, background checks because of it. All right? But we're always adding things to it. Like one thing that we're going to start doing is we're going to start che checking credit reports. Because credit reports will show any major crimes on the credit report. We're in conversation with two retired intelligence agency, uh, two intel intelligent agents uh, from the U.S. government uh, who are advising us. You know, we're always trying to update how we do it. Is it going to be perfect? No, because we live in a fallen world. Okay, but as to date, I don't think we're really helping any priest that's actually been accused of something serious. Yeah, they're not, they're not yes men. Right. Yeah, so, Liz. Um, Father, do you anticipate um, more cancellations as a result of the deterioration of the Catholic Church in Catholicism and all of that um, in, by 2023 when there will be no uh, permission to have Latin Mass in America? Yeah, um, I think we're going to start getting a lot of priests and it is sad because when the Institute had to shut down their masses in Woodlawn, I reached out to them and I never got a response. And I wish they didn't take that line because again, we need to support each other, but anyone here who thinks, well, you know, we gotta support the bishop, okay? The bishop has enough support, okay? Well, one, he has all your money, okay? Second, you, you have to support the clergy and that's not being disobedient. I'm tired of being told I'm being disobedient by, by some who just basically lay down in the mud. That's your option, that's your choice, fine. You don't want to stand up and fight, all right? And I was critical of how, how the priests of St. John Cantius handled things, all right? 
you know, and people say, well, Father, you know, you're not in that situation, you know, they rock in a hard place. Okay, all right. But, you know, they're just basically rolling over. And if you want to do that, that is completely your right and your option as a priest. But then don't turn around and say, oh, we're being obedient. Make, insinuating that we're not. Right? I can guarantee you, if I was disobedient, Bishop Malloy would actually have a canonical case against me. He would love for me to be disobedient. Because then he could really go after me. That hasn't happened yet. Okay? Disobedience is spelled out in canon law. If I commit it, it's a crime that he can go after me for. That has not happened yet. Yes? I think so. Um, the Fraternity of St. Peter did a very smart thing by uh, one of the priests of the fraternity in Europe. His uncle is a cardinal. They were able to get a meeting with the Pope. The Pope basically said the fraternity was exempt from Traditionis Custodis. And a lot of people thought that included the Institute. The problem, as far as I know, with the Institute in Chicago Cardinal Supic was going to allow them to continue doing it as long as they signed a paper that the Novus Ordo is the unique expression of the Roman Rite. No Catholic can sign that. You're lying if you sign that. Okay? And that goes above and beyond. Well, I prefer the Novus Ordo to the Tridentine. It goes above and beyond that. You, you cannot sign a document that's a lie, and that would be a lie. Wow. Look at St. Thomas More. Because something that was just created 50 years ago can't be the unique expression of anything. It's as simple as that. The mass, the mass of the angels, the, the mass of the ages, excuse me, cannot just be simply swept under the rug because people that are stuck in a 1970s mentality want everybody else to be there. Okay? You know, and again, look at what happened Christmas midnight mass. You had St. John Cantius, which, by the way, they can't do that anymore. Bishop Perry, beautiful. Latin, English, Polish hymns. I used to serve that Mass. It was glorious. People would fly in from around the country to attend it. Same night, you had Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat at St. Sabina with Father Flager. And I'm sorry, if you don't like me saying that, watch the video. It was basically out of... Joseph, the amazing Technicolor dream coat. That's allowed with all the abuses, with, the, with women can celebrating and everything, but the traditional Latin mass, no, we gotta, we gotta suppress that. A parish that rose from the ashes, St. John Cantius, it should have been bulldozed decades ago, become one of the most thriving parishes in, in, in the country. Nope, the reason why it's thriving, you can't have that anymore. And guess what? Let me make a prediction, mark the date and the time. I've heard that Supic has already told them one newly ordained priest of St. John Cantius cannot celebrate the traditional Latin Mass. They already can't do it on the first Sunday a month or any major feast, and that they only have about two more years and then they have to stop it completely. And people are like, well, they have the Latin Novus Ordo Ad Orientem. Isn't that good enough? It's a different rite. If you don't believe me, look at it. Look at it in the Latin. It's a completely different rite. But guess what's going to happen? In a, in a couple of years after that, you can't do out orientum anymore. A couple of years after that, you have to have altar girls. A couple of years after that, you have to have extraordinary ministers. That's what they're doing. It's just a slow movement towards that. And then St. John Cantius will get bulldozed. I don't, yeah. Yeah, no, why would, I, why would I drive all the way into the city on Sunday when I can get what they're imposing on St. John Cantius at any suburban parish now? I can guarantee you, most of you that go to the Nova Sordo on Sunday, there is something, there's some type of aberration that is going on where the rubrics are not being followed. Now, one of the problems is, is that the Nova Sordo, the rubrics sometimes are not very precise in what to do, but there are very few parishes, very few, that do the Nova Sordo well. And I have to say, Father Finelli, since 1984, always made sure whether he was pastor or St. John Vianney in North Lake or St. Thomas More on the south side, which actually had the Latin Mass longer than St. John Cantius, 
He always made sure that the Mass, whether it was Novus Ordo or Tridentine, was done to the best of the ability. He didn't have extraordinary ministers. He kept the altar boys. And any vocations that were coming out of this, out of the archdiocese, we're in Juliet right now, were coming out of the archdiocese, many of them have to do because of Father Finelli and the few priests in the archdiocese like him. So for those of you that think that I'm up here bashing the Novus Ordo, I'm not, okay? But there were very few St. John Vianney's across the country probably less than the fingers I have on my hand for the whole country. That says something. Preston, you had a question? Yeah, so, Father, um, I, I heard from a, a well-known journalist, a well-known Catholic, uh, who told me that he has five sources that told him that Pope Francis is dying. And he wanted to ask Cardinal Mueller about that. I subsequently mentioned that, asked that of another priest in St. Louis when I was down there for a wedding. He said, I can corroborate that. He said, but I don't think it's imminent. I think maybe within six months. So, so there are people, the Holy Father is in a wheelchair. I never see him standing there. So there are people who are very involved in Washington, D.C. and the Diocese of Arlington holding public square grocery rallies in front of the Table notes to share every Saturday morning. We went to one of them. We helped organize one. Yeah. We're part of that. So, uh, the, the, a number of people think that once Pope Francis goes on to his eternal reward, that this tradition's custodians will be reversed by the next pope. It could, but I mean, but bear in mind the cardinals that he's naming make him look conservative, a lot of them. He's stacking the deck. My, my question is. No, they were, they were around a lot longer before Traditionis Custodis. The Coalition for Canceled Priests was founded before Traditionis Custodis came out, all right? You know, a lot of the priests have been removed because they won't go along with the jab mandates or with the COVID things. And you know, to get back to the earlier question, if we could go to another diocese that we would, I can no longer in good conscience give communion on the hand. I'm not doing it anymore. It's wrong. There's too many abuses with it. It's not part of the tradition of the Roman Rite. It never has been. It was instituted and forced on us, despite the bit, fact that the bishops voted against it. They, they gerrymandered the voting in order to get it through. And what, what happens? You have about 10 to 12 percent, according to Pew, that now, after COVID, now attend Mass regularly on Sundays. And so what I always like to say to all the neocons out there, who want to say, oh, well, the traditional Latin mass group is so small. Two things on that. If it's so small, why are they attacking it? And two, guess what? You go there, there's so many babies screaming, it's hard to hear anything. I'm going to go with something that's only 1% or 2% of the church, but young, then 10 or 12% that is slowly going down. Before COVID, it was 20% attending mass. Now it's 10 to 12. Good bishops for doing that. And I'm sorry, everyone should be enraged for how every single bishop handled COVID. Every single one. And for those of you that want to say that I'm downplaying COVID, not that anybody here would be, but for anyone that's saying that I'm downplaying COVID, I got COVID, I gave it to my father, my father died from it. All right, but he'll be the first one to tell you, you don't shut down churches. Yeah, dispense people, especially the elderly, from having to go. But sorry, we're adults, we can make our own decisions. And I'm sorry, but the Eucharist and all the sacraments, but especially the Eucharist, is essential. Period. Before I come back over here, any other questions? Yes? I, question. I didn't even see you standing there. I'm sorry. I have a question. And it's not just my question, but when I told people that I'm supporting the canceled priests, here's the question. I need a simple answer. I yeah. need like the three minute pitch, you know? Yeah. Oh, I could give it to you in less than three minutes. I can give it to you in 30 seconds. All right, and I said it earlier, all right? And they're so sassy about it. 
Where do we get the term? Well, yeah, they're so sassy about it. They went, why weren't you sassy when they when McCarrick was uncovered? You know. Monsignor, Monsignor Grinder. So here it is. So can't we we took the term cancel from cancel culture, and I always simply say to people like, well, what's the difference between a cancel priest that did nothing wrong and a cancel priest that did something wrong? Two answers to that. One, if you've done something wrong and you've been removed, that's justice. That's not being canceled. You should be removed. Okay. Second, I always say, well, you know what cancel culture is in society, right? I think, oh yeah. I go, well, define it for me. And they say, well, when somebody says something that's the truth or something that's benign and they get attacked for it by the left, I said, there you go. That's what happens in the church. Okay. That is what happens in the church. It's as simple as that. And I'm sorry, you know what? If a young man wants to get ordained and wants to only celebrate the traditional Latin mass, he should be allowed to do that, and you will let the people decide by the wallets and by their feet which one they prefer. All right? And I'm going to tell you, Father Bajera, who has the fraternity parish at Joliet, okay, I think he's either in the restroom or he had to leave, okay, his church is bulging, and that church, uh, St. Joseph's of Rockdale, was on the verge of closing before the fraternity took it over. It is now one of the most flourishing parishes in the Diocese of Joliet. You're not going to tell me that good is coming from that. It's as simple as that. And if people are going to say, well, you know, there's cranks in the, in the traditional movement. Yeah, I know. Just like there are with the neocons and the charismatics. You know, there's cranks with every group. If we're going to start punishing whole groups of people based on the cranks in the group, well, we're all doomed, starting with the USCCB. Okay, some of you got that joke. Good, yes. <laughs> Well, and bear in mind, there's no accusation against me. Okay. There's nothing against me. But, I, yeah, I know, but maybe that was part of Bishop Malloy's, you know, uh, ostensible justification. You know, because none of them are coming forward and say, well, this priest likes the traditional Latin mass, so I'm removing it. They don't say that publicly. But if they're, my point is, if they're making up anything that's false, are they opening themselves up? They are. There are certain priests that certainly had uh, a defamation lawsuit. They chose not to pursue it. In my opinion, that was a mistake because the only way to get a bishop to do something right is when they realize they're about to lose a lot of money or they're about to look really bad in the media. Okay? And look, can I, can I just simply say something? There's many people in this room, including myself, that have a problem with Michael Voris and Church Militant. Although I think Michael Forrest has spoken at these luncheons in the past. But if it wasn't for Church Militant, the Bishop of Buffalo would still be the Bishop of Buffalo. The bishops have caused that bulldog journalism, like Church Militant and other groups, to, to come about. And so while Michael Voris might be very brash to some people, and some people might not like his tone and everything, He's not always wrong in what he's doing, okay? I think he goes after trads a little bit too much. I understand his reasoning, but I'll, I'm going to simply say this. He's gotten a lot of things right, okay? And it's, not, it's more than just the clock, a broken clock being right twice a day, all right? He's gotten a lot more than just two things right. And, but if we're just going to start dismissing people because we don't like their tone, that's how we're going to get picked off. That's how we're going to get picked off. And my suggestion is, is that we stop doing that. 
We actually unite as a coalition, not just the Coalition for Canceled Priests, but the real term coalition, and try to fight what is going on in the church. Okay, but if you're gonna, if we're gonna keep camping, and well, I believe this, and I, you know, I did, that doesn't really concern me, blah, 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 well, then we're gonna easily be picked off. It's as simple as that. So, any other questions? I can do this until you guys drop, so. I would make a great press secretary, yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, trust me, with the high water table and all the problems with it, we won't be, we weren't, we, it was a good thing that we passed on it. Because then the coalition would have been come raising money to save a property, which, by the way, the Franciscans didn't take care of the property. It's as simple as that. So, anything else? What well, Well, first, like I said, and we'll end with this, pray and fast, okay, for us. Support the coalition and other good Catholic groups. If, you're, if, you, if you keep putting money in your collection plate, you are simply supporting the bishop and the bishops going not only after good priests, but supporting anti-life initiatives, okay, because the bishops care more about the Democrat Party as a whole, care more about the Democrat Party um, than they do about actual life issues, okay? And for those of you that don't believe that or don't understand it, please invite uh, the Lepanto Institute, uh, Michael, last name? Hitchborn. Hitchborn, to come and speak here. And he will lay out to you evidence of what, like, you know, this whole, the rice bowl, um, all these different charities that they do, how they're all going to fund Democrat initiatives. It's as simple as that. Oh, good. Good. So, yeah. So, if there's not a COVID lockdown, what can we do to support our priests? And maybe they don't want to go along with the bishop in denying the Eucharist. So, Father, Father Eckert up at St. Saint, Saint Augustine's in Minnesota, he was one of the few priests that actually did the right thing. And this was in Minnesota in March, mind you. He just started having Mass outside. And it got to the point where other bishops were like, Beloy basically told the priest, well, you can't do parking lot masses. I would just simply say, no, sorry, I'm doing it. Cardinal Supic says, said, said, oh, you can't, you, you, have, you need my permission to baptize even in an emergency. That's a lie. And again, that's one of those things where if you don't do it, every single person in this room, you are morally obligated. I said this in the first Lombard event we had here. Every single person in this room is morally obligated to baptize in an emergency. Every single person. And a bishop can't take that away. So these stupid things that they were saying. Okay. And I know the ecclesiastical abstention doctrine of the state. And the Protestants used it to our advantage. You realize there were no restrictions on churches since May of 2020. And the bishops continued to go along with uh, Pritzker and all of that. Okay. I'm sorry, but whoever invited... Cardinal Supich to the pro-life march uh, in January should should resign now from that. Okay, where he's there lecturing us about wearing masks outside. He got I know he got booed, and rightly so. But then some people say, "Oh, you shouldn't do that to a cardinal." Sorry, when a cardinal says stupid things, he should be reminded of that. And again, that's not be, me being mean or aggressive. That's me speaking truth. Okay, to charity. Okay, sometimes the truth hurts. One of the first things my grandmother ever taught me is this, love hurts. So is it against canon law for priests to say, uh, I think if they're going against the bishop, that we're going to keep having masses, we're going to keep giving the Eucharist, I'm still going to do anointing the sick. Do they have recourse? Can they keep doing it? I would say that they have to do it. it it's civil disobedience at this point. Mm -hmm. Canon law, doesn't, as all laws, don't get that specific. 
Canon law wasn't written thinking that we were going to have a mass pandemic that was going to shut down the churches. By the way, I think in the history of the United States alone, there's been 27 pandemics. This is the first time that they shut down all across the country. Even during the Spanish flu, they didn't shut down completely. Now, they did shut down certain areas. Philadelphia shut down for about four weeks in 1918. That was only four weeks, though. They, had, they, they were shut down for months here. Months. I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't in good conscience deny the people of God that are in my charge the sacraments for that long. You can't have funerals. You can't go to the hospital to anoint. Are you crazy? You can't. They're basically saying that anointing is not that big of a deal. It, trust me, it's a big deal when you're grasping for breath. It's a very big deal. So, and I, I basically, I, all the priests that know me, I basically said, listen, if I'm on my deathbed, I want you coming to visit me every single day. Every single day. Okay? You know, and, and keep that in mind. And I, I encourage people, ever since HIPAA went into effect, always make sure you tell your next of kin that a priest is always welcome to come and visit you in the hospital. This is way before COVID. I mean, because otherwise you're going to be denied the sacraments. It's as simple as that, sad to say. Yes, sir. Just one quick comment. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, very enlightening. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next uh, conference as well. But I wanted to reflect on a couple of things. You know, my dear, uh, my dear Ann Helen, may she rest in peace, would always say you hope with your dollars, right? It's just in general. My wonderful wife always says, follow the money. And, and, and I, I, I want to recognize Father Cavalli again for, for the spiritual Oh, yeah. And bear in mind, remember, it's coalition for canceled priests, not coalition of canceled priests. It is a lay movement. I'm the only priest on the board. Okay, David Avignone is our executive director. All of you have the postcards for our event in June. It's going to be up in Rosemont. Encourage people to come from across the country when they say, oh, Chicago. It's not Chicago. It's Rosemont. Rosemont's safer than Lombard. Okay. If you don't believe me, go to, go to Rosemont. So the mob keeps that place very safe. So I, I used to work there. I, I used to be a waiter at the Capitol Grill in Rosemont as a priest in order to save myself. This is another reason we have the coalition. is so priests don't have to do that. By the way, being a bartender and server is great for building character. And it's a great reminder for priests that we are servants. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, and, and listen, bartenders are priests, basically. There are no better counselors than priests and bartenders. So I'm just going to leave it there. But I wanted to make sure that we got the conferences because David was getting that, giving me that look of, don't forget to mention the conference. So. I was going to tell you to mention the conference too, Father. Um, just thank you so much. I know that this has been really, really wonderful.